What are you passionate about? What do you know? How can you add value to other people? And how can you easily sell it? Like create a business like that, like create a website, create a PayPal account, have a checkout, get in front of your target market. Um, and, and that's that's what the avenue that I would be trying to go down is how do I set up a business and as little money as possible, but have me have control of the business, me have control of the customers. So I'm not relying on that Amazon or that Facebook. All right, guys, welcome back to the Ash Tabba Show. And today I'm joined by serial entrepreneur, Nathan Hirsch, who launched his own e-commerce store from his dorm room. Uh, got that to, if I'm not mistaken, around $25 million in sales, all with the yep. aid of virtual assistants. Um, his experience in doing that then led him to partner up with his co-founder of uh, FreeUp, who was Connor. Uh, and they recently sold free up um for how much was that sold for nathan yeah so we're, we're not allowed to share how much we sold it for. Uh, okay a lot of money he's on for a lot of money <laughs> um and now has gone on to want to share that experience right you've got outsource school uh which is this new course uh which we'll i'm sure get into in the podcast where you're looking to share the knowledge and insights of how to leverage vas and, and freelancers to, to grow your online business so welcome to the show nathan um thanks for joining me yeah. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. Cool. So I've kind of given a super bridge version there. I'm sure there's loads more to it. Uh, let's maybe get into super quick your sort of origin story in a bit more detail. How did you kind of get into this e-com world? And then how's it brought you to, to where you are now? Yeah, so growing up, my parents were both teachers, and I always thought I'd have the mentality of going to school, getting a real job, work for 30 years, and retire, and that would be my life. And around high school, I started getting 40, 50 hour week summer jobs, and I learned a lot about sales and business and management. And I also hated, I also learned how much I hated just having a boss. And I kind of got a glimpse for what life was like after college. So when I got to college, I went to Quinnipiac in Connecticut. I started to look at that as a ticking clock. I had four years to start my own business or I was gonna have to go out, get a real job and never look back. So I started hustling right from the beginning. I took that summer money that I had made and I started buying people's textbooks, competing with my school bookstore. I was offering higher prices. I created a referral program. So if you told someone else, you got a kickback. And before I knew it, I had lines out the door of people trying to sell me their books to the point where I got a cease and desist letter from my college telling me to <laughs> knock it off. <laughs> That's awesome. So that was like my first glimpse into being an entrepreneur and I didn't want to get kicked out of school. Again, my parents were teachers that would not have gone over very well. And so I stopped selling books, but I had sold some of these books on Amazon and this was 2008, so no one really knew what Amazon was. It was kind of this big bookstore getting into other things, and I thought it was so cool. I could have this 24-7 storefront and all that, and I just had to figure out what to sell. And at the same time, I didn't have a, a warehouse to put anything. I didn't have a lot of money in my bank account. So I came up with the idea of drop shipping years before I even knew it was called drop shipping. the concept that someone else would make the product and ship it and keep my credit card on file and I would sell it and handle the customer service and it would be a win for both sides. And so I started experimenting with drop shipping with sporting equipment and video games and, and, and outdoor supply, typical college guy stuff. And I just failed over and over and over. I couldn't get anything to sell the things that sold terrible margins and Finally, I came across baby products and they started to sell and they started to sell quickly. So before I knew it, I'm this 20 year old single college guy selling millions of dollars of baby products on Amazon. And I, my parents tell me I should probably pay taxes. So I meet with an accountant. And the first question he asked me is, when are you going to hire your first person? Mm -hmm. And I kind of shrugged him off. Like, why would I do that? That's money out of my pocket. They're going to steal my ideas. They're going to hurt my business. I'm sure you've had it. We've all had it. Classic entrepreneurial excuses of why not to hire. Yep. And he just laughed in my face and said, you're going to learn this lesson on your own. Well, sure enough, first busy season comes around. Fourth quarter, I get destroyed. I'm working 20 hours a day. My social life plummets. My grades go down. I'm doing every part of the business myself. And when I finally get to January and somehow I kept that business alive, I, I think to myself, okay, I need to hire someone right now. So Post a job on Facebook. This guy in my business law class messages me, says, hey, I need a job. Um, I don't even interview him. I hire him on the spot. And even the first day of work, he calls me and he goes, man, I, I don't have a car, by the way. Can you come pick me up? <laughs> and I'm like, who is this guy? So 
I, I ended up picking him up and it's Connor. It's my business partner. We've been working together for, for awesome. 10 years. Awesome. So I get super lucky. He's smart. He's hardworking. We have a lot of the same values, same beliefs. But I mean, there I am as a 20 year old thinking, man, this thing is, this hiring thing's easy. You post a job, you get someone on Facebook, your life becomes easier. You don't even have to interview them. And I just made bad hire after bad hire after bad hire after that, learning so much about hiring and the hiring process and eventually giving up on college kids and moving into the remote virtual space and use the Upworks, use the fibers, really hated the experience, even though I found a few good people here and there. And yeah. finally, after looking and looking for something faster, I, I started free up uh, with, with $5,000, which you can get into. But that, that's kind of the, the bridge version of how I went from a broke sure. college kid to e-commerce to eventually the hiring space. And I think the super interesting thing about that is what you said midway through the convo, where you were saying, you tried a bunch of different shit. You know, like a lot of people think even now, drop shipping, cool, I'll find a product, it's going to trend, I'm going to put it out there, and I'll become rich in like a week. But, right. and like, it's not always a cool product, right? Like you said, you went for the stuff maybe you like, but you kind of fell into baby products. And, you know, I think maybe that's that, that sort of stuff that comes out of being an innate entrepreneur. But I'm really curious about people that aren't maybe wired that way, because it sounds like you were. But think now, the current climate, you know, it's rough. People are getting laid off. I know loads of clients that are firing like 80% of their teams. I'm sure you know the same. A lot of people are probably waking up to that idea of there's no job for life and you're not guaranteed anything. So it's best time now is, is to go and set up your own thing. How, how does someone who's not <coughs> serially get into that mindset? Like what's the biggest barrier you think they're going to have to overcome? So for me, and I think I naturally do this, I think my business partner does the opposite of this. I never look at, I never really have the end in mind, which is weird, right? Because you always hear like entrepreneurs like, oh, you got to know what you want to build. But for me, it's like, all right, I have a basic direction I want to go into, but I'm going to try out the market. I'm going to do a lot of trial and error. I'm not going to dump $100,000 into my idea and then bring it to market and get feedback and see if it works. I've started all three of my businesses with less than $5,000. And we're even doing that now. We did it with Amazon where we tried lots of different things and eventually found it and developed. And we did it with FreeUp. We started it. We got it out there and we got feedback and we built it up based on what people wanted. And we're kind of doing the same thing with Outsource School. We started off saying, okay, we got this one course. We're going to teach people how to interview, onboard, train, and manage VAs. And people like that course. So now we're coming out with a new course called the Podcast Outreach Formula, teaching people how to use VAs for podcasts. Our developer from FreeUp, after the buyout, he was part of the buyout and he reached out to us and he, he's been working on software and we're like, let's make this a part of Outsource School. So now we're going to be launching an SOP building software to make it easier for creating um, a standard operating procedure. So kind of bring it all together. And I was, so Mark, who bought FreeUp, who, who's a, a good friend of mine now, um, he loved Outsource School and we were chatting about it. And he, I hadn't talked to him for probably a month and a half. And I was like, let me, let me catch you up to speed because we've developed this idea a lot further in a month and a half. Back when I talked to you last time, it was just one course. So things kind of develop over time based on how you read the market and how everything's going. Sure. So Let's go into outsource school a little bit then as well, because there's some small businesses in the world now that are, you know, they're worried. Are they going to be able to keep going? Can they keep their permanent staff? Some are, you know, maybe going to shut down. It seems to me like VAs and freelancers is an area for them to tap into to at least steady the ship and maybe find a new way of working. I guess, would you A, agree with that? And then B, how could something like outsource school help with them to reframe their approach to a maybe archaic way of, of business. Yeah. And I want to start by saying I, I would never use Corona or anything else like that to promote my business in any way. That's not really my style, but I think as a, a population, like we were going towards more remote anyway, this yeah. whole thing just kind of sped that process. Up this is and, the kick in the ass over the cliff that was coming anyway. Right. So I'm with you. Exactly. And, and people have been realizing that for years where, Hey, if you have one employer and they fire you, you get laid off, whatever, like you're out of revenue. If you're a VA and you have multiple clients and one drops you still sucks, but not as big of a, a, a deal. So I, I think both sides are kind of realizing that the pros outweigh the cons nowadays, especially with technology and just the ability to hire people all over the world at different skill sets, different price points, full-time, part-time, project-based. And if you are going through struggles, I, I guess the only tip that I can give is just communicate at the highest possible level. If you have a team and they're probably worried and you're worried, 
communicate with them. Every business is hit differently. They might have three clients and all three clients are affected differently by this situation. So keep the communication option open. Try to give them some options. If you have to go into problem solving mode, hey, do you want to reduce your hours? Do you want to reduce your rate? Let's make this temporary. If you need other clients, give them a letter of referral. Post on social media. Say, hey, I have a great VA. Anyone want them part-time so that you can fill up those extra hours? Just do everything possible to communicate it and help them out. And I do think if you haven't hired VAs before and this experience kind of opened up the eyes for it, then yeah, education on how to use virtual assistants is something that would have helped you with business before all of this and is only going to be more relevant going forward. hundred percent. And I, I think from when I was, you know, reading up on, on what you've done with, with this and with free up as well, I thought it was super interesting how you kind of kind of clarify VAs and assistants in sort of different parts where you sort of talk about the different levels of, of the experience that that person has. Maybe we can speak to that a little bit too, because there's people out there that have 10, 15 years of experience and others that, you know, maybe are going to do more hands-on granular work. What's your, what's your philosophy on that? And you're right. I mean, VA for to a lot of people is just a generic term, right? Like everyone that works from home is, is a virtual assistant. But the way that I personally like to divide it up is you got the followers, you got the doers, and you got the experts. So the followers are what I consider the VAs, five to 10 bucks an hour, usually non-US. They have years of experience, but they're there to follow your system, your process. If you don't have systems and processes, you're going to struggle to hire those followers, those virtual assistants. The, the doers are the freelancers, the graphic designers, the writers, the video editors. You're not teaching a graphic designer how to be a graphic designer but they're not consulting with you either. They're there to do that one specific task at a really high level over and over again. And then you got the experts, they could be 30 bucks an hour, they could be a thousand bucks an hour, they're high level freelancers, coaches, consultants, agencies that they bring their own system, their own process to the table, that they have that strategy component. And just like you shouldn't hire a VA and say, hey, I don't know how to run Facebook ads, go run my Facebook ads for me, you shouldn't hire an expert who has their own system that they've had success with and say, hey, I'm hiring you, but I need you to do it my way. And sure. making sure you hire the right levels and, and handle that relationship appropriately is really one of the keys to hiring. Yeah, I think the skill set part is, is the key thing, right? Like, you know, you fall into a career, you get one skill, and then you think that that's it, you're set. And obviously, you've had to reinvent and evolve with what you've done with all your three businesses. And I think a lot of people are going to find themselves moving more into that, into that wheelhouse of reskilling and learning new skills on a continuous basis. Um, so have you, have you heard of the book Sapiens? Have you read that book? No, I haven't. It's the guy, is it Joel Harari, I think is his name. He's got three books and Sapiens is where he talks about like the history of society and how we're set to be sort of tight knit communities that come together. But once you go over a certain number of like, I think 120, the processes have to change and evolve. Um, but the reason I bring him up is in his latest book, I think it's 21 Ways for the 21st Century, he talks about kind of what I think we're starting to get into now, which is we're going to have to rescale every, maybe every decade or even every five years with the right technologies going. And I think that's maybe scary for some people. Um, but I think, yeah, like, you know, PPC, what I came into 10 years ago is to totally evolved. And if you don't stay skilled and learn the new stuff, you're, you're not going to stay ahead. Like, do you think it's going to be more of a cutthroat market with that in mind? Yeah. And I think you also have to be, be careful of the big players that control everything. So on Amazon, mm -hmm. one of the reasons I got out of Amazon is they controlled everything. They could shut me down. They could change their algorithm and all of that. And you have to think about that in all aspects of our business because so many people are dependent on Facebook ads or Google SEO or whatever it is. And one quick change shakes up the whole program. And there's no way that you can protect yourself from everything. At some level, you, you probably want to be running Facebook ads. You want to be doing different things, but you never want all your eggs in one basket and you have to prepare for change. You can't just be running 95% or get 95% of your revenue through Facebook ads and be like, Oh, I figured it out. You got to have those backup things in place. And I think even a, just a, a thing like this with Corona where something comes out of the blue and, and shakes it up, I think is a wake up call, not just for, for that and working remote, but just across the board that you need to have certain contingencies in place and you sometimes have to be prepared for the worst. And one last thing, my, my business partner, Connor, super optimistic guy. I tend to be a little bit more pessimistic, not in the sense of like woes me or my life sucks or anything like that. More in terms of business, I always assume that like the worst thing will happen which I think complements each other very well because 
he's always looking for great opportunities and, and the best thing that can happen. And I'm always trying to protect the business from everything that, that I view as a threat, which I feel like from a business side, that, that's a good way to go about it. Probably not that great from a stress side. We'll call it practical. Let's call it practical as opposed to pessimism. I think that's, that's a nice Right. I think you're use, right. That's right? a better word. Um, <laughs> but you need, yeah, I guess, look, you guys have been business partners for over a decade, right? So you need that yin and yang to complement. And, you know, without you, he wouldn't be where he is and likewise. So, well, that's interesting. Let's talk about that too. Like finding people to jam with and collaborate with. How important is that from your journey? And you think people should be searching that out if they find the right person? Uh, yeah, I mean, having a business partner is, is super tough. It's, it's something that, that takes a lot of time and effort. And for me, I kind of use the, the what, what I try to get in a business partner or really anyone that I work with is I want them to have the same core values and beliefs. I believe in sharing ideas. I believe in treating people well. I believe that if you make a mistake, you should own up to it and do everything possible to fix it and not blame other people. And I believe in problem solving and thinking logically and working quickly. And, and if, if I can't, if those, if the person I want to work with is really talented, but they don't have those same core beliefs, it, it's not going to work out. It's going to lead to a lot of frustration on, 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 on one side. And it's not that I'm right or they're wrong or either one of those. It's just about working together for that common goal. But I want them to have the exact opposite skill sets. I mean, outdoor school doesn't need four Nathan Hirsch's. Outdoor school needs one Nathan Hirsch and then needs a lot of other people that are good at all the things that I'm not good at, which is a lot of things. I mean, the average entrepreneur is only good at one to three things, their, their core competency. And you want to hire people that have those beliefs that are, that can do all those other skill sets. And they have to be willing to work on the relationship and make it better and better over time. I mean, I remember Connor and I, one of our, our worst business decisions that we made was getting, getting an office around year four or five of the Amazon business. And cost a lot of money, added a lot of overhead, was a terrible decision. Um, and, and it doesn't really matter who, who wanted it, who didn't want it. Like we both agreed to it together. And, and it took a little bit of getting over that because up to that point, we had only seen success. And it, it's really easy to have a business partner where oh, when all you're doing is winning, it's when something goes wrong and you lose a lot of money or you make some bad decisions that you really figure out, hey, can I overcome that and work with this person long term? And I think in this game, it's like, you're going to fail probably on the daily and make decisions that don't always work. And I suppose it's getting comfortable with that lack of comfort, um, which is tough for some people. Um, how, how do you kind of, do you have like any processes or mindset kind of tips or hacks that you use for dealing with just that day to day, you know, knowing that something is going to come and bat you back? Yeah, I mean, the one rule that we have is you, you can never go back and say, oh, but like this was your idea. Like once, once we agree to move something or move forward with something, like it's ours together. It doesn't matter who, what we thought about it before. Um, so that, that is totally out the window. And then the second thing is looking at everything like a problem. So the way that I solve problems in life and business is I gather all the information. I see what resources I have available. I figure out what are the different options for a plan. I pick a plan, I execute that plan using the resources. And once we've executed that plan, the step that everyone forgets is put steps in place so that exact same problem can't happen again. So if you follow that and every time you have a down, you go through that process, you're gonna end up on top nine out of 10 times. And I guess the other part of it is, is when you're a young entrepreneur, you kind of have those highs and lows, right? When you're, when you're doing great, you think you're on top of the world, no one can touch you. When you're doing low, you think you're gonna become homeless and, and go bankrupt. And then sure. as you get deeper into being an entrepreneur, that line starts to get a little bit more level. And the highs, you're like, okay, we're doing good. Let's keep this momentum going. And the lows are more like, okay, this is a problem. We're gonna solve it. Let's figure out how to solve it. And I guess when the highs are there, you can be practical about knowing that the, the lows are gonna come again at some point and you can kind of just have contingencies for that as best as possible, right? Which is right, which is key. So let's let's get into outsource school and maybe why I get the why, I suppose, but what was that leap like from free up, which you'd grown, was doing super well, was a great business. What was that moment where you kind of had that decision between the two of you where you went, it's time for something new? Yeah. So, I mean, at the end of last year, or middle of last year, a client of ours reached out to us to acquire FreeUp. And that was a whole process of due diligence. And they made us an offer, which we felt was more than aggressive or more than fair or even aggressive. Um, we made sure that our team and our clients and our freelancers were taken care of. We love Mark Hargrove, David Martin. They're going to do a great job growing FreeUp. And we really looked at it as a win-win for everyone. And 
We even took $500,000 from the sale and gave it to our internal team in the Philippines to reward them for their hard work because that's something that we believe in. And, and so off of that, I mean, we were running an eight figure business with me, my business partner, Russell, who, who's a developer. He's not doing the day-to-day -day operations and a team of 35 VAs in the Philippines. And that was it. That was the entire business. There's no office, no U S employees. And we didn't just wake up one day and hire 35 people and cross our fingers and hope it worked out. We had systems and processes of how to interview them, how to onboard them, how to train them, how we kept turnover less than 3% by showing appreciation and creating a family and all that stuff. And over the past few years, people have been asking me like, how do you do it? Can you walk me through it? Can you help me do it? And I've gone on podcasts, I've written blog articles, but I've never had like a concrete, like this is my system, follow it. And so when the, the transition with free up ended, which was 90 days. We had the idea to create this one course called cracking the VA code, which would walk people through our exact interview process, our exact onboarding process, how we train VAs and value our time. And once we've invested time, energy, and money into them, how we keep them around for, for years to come. And that was the idea. And we had Nate McAllister who had been a partner of free up. He reached out to, to help with it and we added him in. And once we got that course launched, like I, I mentioned, uh, Russell came in with the software and we had some other ideas, but we, two sides of it. One, we really, really want to help entrepreneurs scale and grow using VAs. It's something we believe in. It's something that we think a lot of entrepreneurs can do better. And second, we're a big part of the VA community. I love the VA community. I have a lot of great relationships in the Philippines. We didn't want to sell free up and just say, bye guys, see you later. Um, we, so a percentage of all sales of Outsource School is going towards our favorite charity, Teach for the Philippines, which provides education to Filipino children so they can become VAs or, or pursue whatever career they want to pursue. So it all kind of goes back full circle. And, and I think it, it's a reminder of in the Amazon business, the reason that Connor and I got really sick of it by the end is we weren't really helping anyone. We were helping me, the business, the team, the manufacturers, and that was it. And with free up, we really loved that we helped a lot of entrepreneurs and paid out millions of dollars to VAs and freelancers. And we want to have that same type of effect with outsource school. I think the through line that, you know, just coming out of this is the the deeper ongoing impact and connection with with people, right? Like we talk about Amazon and you don't even get the client details at the end of it from the sale. So you can't build a relationship with them to help them beyond the sale in any real way. Um, and obviously with free up, like you said, you use the word family and building that kind of vibe. And I think that's coming through pretty clearly that beyond the numbers and the bottom line and the figures, there's this deeper sense of trying to foster this idea of, of community and then giving back to the community. Is that a fair assumption or am I just reading things? No, I, I, I completely agree. And it all kind of comes down to, to what your why is. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs get into it like, oh, I want to make a lot of money. And then the ones that do make a lot of money, they kind of go through a honeymoon period where you buy some stuff and, and then you realize, okay, this isn't that rewarding. Like I want to actually help people. I want to actually contribute. And I think that's kind of what, what we went through. I mean, we got into this when we were super young, super immature and, and all the stuff that, that goes with that. And I think as you get a little bit older and a little bit more mature, the, the stuff that's really rewarding isn't looking at your monthly report. It's talking to entrepreneurs like I was this morning who t are taking our Cracking the VA course and they're like, wow, like I did not know how to do this before. I've been doing it way differently and, and now they can apply it to their business and that's going to help them pursue their dreams, what they're passionate about. So let, let's maybe get into like one or two kind of quick tips that you can divulge uh, on how an entrepreneur or a small business might better leverage their VAs. And I know you have a lot in the course that they can delve into, but maybe some super quick nuggets for anyone watching that they can maybe just look at and it might reframe something for them. Yeah, so I mentioned there's four different parts, right? You got, uh, you got interviewing, onboarding, training, and managing. Most people know you have to interview a virtual assistant. Most people know you have to train a virtual assistant. And most people know on some level you need to manage the virtual assistant after you train them. What most people skip is the onboarding, and it is the most important part of hiring. So let's say that I interview a bunch of VAs. I want to hire Jane. I want to hire Jane at five bucks an hour to be my VA. What the average entrepreneur does is they say, Jane, that was a great interview. You're hired at five bucks an hour. Let's jump into training. What I teach people to do is, Jane, that was a great interview. I want to hire you at five bucks an hour. Let's make sure you're really good with five bucks an hour. But before you accept the job, I want to go through what I call my sick method, S-I-C-C. -C. And I want to make sure that we're on the same page with everything before you get started. And only if we're on the same page do we jump into training. And if you want to back out at any time, I'd much rather you back out now than before we invest time, energy, and money into you. So 
for us, we go through schedule. We talk about the schedule she needs to work for me. What other clients she has? What are the schedules for those clients? Is there any overlap? Is she working 100 hours a week already and she's going to be exhausted by the time she comes and works for me? We get on the same page. We go through issues. Does she have a fast computer? Does she have a backup computer if that breaks? Internet. How often do you lose internet? Do you have a hotspot you can use? Do you have a friend's house you can go to if you lose internet? Or can you just not work until the internet comes back? Same thing with power. Do you have a backup generator? Do you have a place to go? Personal issues, how we set the expectation that personal issues can interfere with work for an extended period of time. Are you one personal issue away from not being able to work? And weather, do you live in a rural area, a city? How much is the weather a factor? Not that they have control over that, but that's something that, that we wanna know up front. Next is communication. The way I communicate with the VA is different than the way you communicate. Some people like certain communication methods, methods, some people hate them. So we go through, hey, we use Slack, we use email, we use Viber. For emails, we expect a response within a business day. For Slack, you need to be on Slack every time you're working. And we answer any questions and it might be different than what our other clients do. And then last is culture. I mentioned family and feedback and ideas and all the stuff that we have hold valuable. We go through it with them and make sure they're on the same page. And again, at the end, we give them a chance to back out. And this is a 15 to 30 minute meeting that's gonna save you hours and hours of time down the line. And most entrepreneurs don't do it. It's interesting, isn't it? Because when you like get a new client, when I, from agency life, you get a new client, you do an onboarding process for the client right. and the business. And it's always found, you know, be by surprise that we don't apply these business methods to people. And I think it's super right. interesting that you've taken that and gone, well, you onboard a new client, you have that one, two hour meeting, you go through all the core KPIs and everything you've just said, how do we communicate? Is it a weekly call? Is it a monthly call? Do we need a report? Who's on the team? How do we want to communicate? Email, phone call? Well, yeah, why wouldn't you do that with, with a freelancer or a VA? And it makes total sense, but it's usually the stuff that's right in front of you that makes sense that you sort of skip. Um, do you find most of the people that are coming to you are having that kind of reaction where it's like, I didn't even think of that, but it's a game changer. I, I think it's a combination of, of that that they didn't even think about it, or they do a level of onboarding, but we try to make it easier. I mean, in the course, we have a cheat sheet that you literally go through on Slack and you just check off all the boxes. And, and by the time you get to the end, they either check all the boxes or, or they don't. And, and we have screen shares of us actually onboarding VA, so you can see a good onboarding versus bad onboarding and stuff like that. So um, I, I think it's a combination of people that are either doing it on some level and not doing it well, or missing some things that we think are important that might cause hassle down the line, or just forget getting that step all together. Awesome. And let's maybe sort of take a step back in that process. So I'm an entrepreneur. I've grown a business to a level that I can't put in 20 hours a day without wanting to jump off of a bridge. And that's not good for anybody. So I want to hire someone. Obviously, you know, free up, we can go to free up and find people on there. But there are other places that you spoke to Upwork, Fiverr, which have varying degrees of, of success. Like how how do you recommend an entrepreneur or a business goes about trying to even source and find these VAs in the first place? Because they don't all live in one place. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, obviously I'm biased. I mean, uh -huh. I, 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 I love FreeUp. Uh, I'm actually a client of FreeUp now, which is kind of funny. I just hired my first VA from FreeUp. She started yesterday. So that must I, be I'm weird. a big for is that it weird? is weird, but it's awesome at the same time because I love the free up team. So like Chiefs and Jane and Layden, who are my assistants on free up, I got to talk to them and, and they're actually prepping my VA. They're like, oh, I'm like, hey, can you tell them everything they need to know about working with me? Because I'm not the easiest person to work with. I'm fun to work with, but I, I have high expectations. So sure. there, there's that element of it. But yeah, I mean, if you're listening, I, I definitely recommend the free up marketplace. They pre-vet people. You get access to them quickly. You can start right away. 24 seven support and my personal favorite, if someone quits on you, they cover all replacement costs. And so you kind of have that protection there. And, and if you email Joyce at freeup.com, she was my top like uh, VA filling assistant at freeup and she'll hook you up with a great virtual assistant. And I have nothing to do with freeup anymore, but it's still my go-to. And I'm sure there's a lot of other platforms as well that you can find VAs. Yeah. I'll put a link to free up in the, uh, in the comments down below as well. So people can go through. Cause I can vouch for that. I mean, that's how I met you and uh, you know, I've got work off the back of free up not as a VA, as more of the sort of, you know, consulting higher end level. And so there is, there is a mix. There's a mix of stuff on there. It's not just, you know, the fivers of the world where it's sort of only VA at $5 an hour. I think that's also a key distinction of the free up platform. Right. So I, I want to touch on maybe people who aren't set up as a business yet in that capacity. You know, 
the guy who's now thinking, shit, my hours are being cut to like half or I've, I've been made redundant and no one's hiring now. And they're thinking, maybe I need to do something like is drop shipping a way to go? Do I set up my own business? What, what's your take on that now? Because you said you started in 08 when it was kind of a fresh thing. Do you still see it as a viable thing to get into? And if so, how would you do it if you were going to do it today uh, with all, all that you know? Yeah, I personally wouldn't get into drop shipping now. It is very saturated. And it's not to mean that you can't make money on it. There's plenty of people that open up new drop shipping stores and succeed. But it was an entirely different animal in 2008. It was me and like a handful of other people doing it. Now everyone's teaching it. Lots of people are doing it. There's new sellers all the time. And so drop shipping is not the avenue I would take. Again, going through, hey, do I really want to depend on one source, especially like drop shipping on Amazon? But there's lots of ways to still make money right now. There are businesses that are spending money. And whether you're building your own agency or starting your own funnel or your own online business, I mean, that's the avenue that, that I would do. And I would try lots of different things and figure out what you're good at, what you can add value to. Um, there's a great book called The $100 Startup. I might be messing up the name. I'm pretty sure that's the exact name. And it's all about figuring out what are you passionate about? What do you know? How can you add value to other people? And how can you easily sell it? Like create a business like that. Like create a website, create a PayPal account, have a checkout, get in front of your target market. Um, and, and that's that's what the avenue that I would be trying to go down is how do I set up a business and as little money as possible, but have me have control of the business, me have control of the customers. So I'm not relying on that Amazon or that Facebook. Gotcha. And I think the key is like, just start, right? It doesn't have to be perfect. You know, just go. If it's a bit ghetto at the beginning, you just go and then you can scale it from there and bring in the VAs and make it fancier and polish the site and all the rest of it later. But I guess test and learn and just, just put something out there is the first sort of stepping stone, right? Right. A hundred percent. Awesome. All right, man. Well, look, I like to round off podcasts like this with uh, something totally different, which is a series of, of 10 questions that, uh, that I've been inspired to take from inside the actor's studio. If you ever watched that show, did you watch that show? No, I didn't. Never. I'm going to swipe them. So at least I'm giving them homage. Uh, before I do, is there anything that you, uh, you want to talk about anything that you want to kind of promote beyond what we've spoken about already? You think it's really important. Yeah. Well, anyone that wants to connect with me, I'm, I'm one of the easiest entrepreneurs to connect with. Go to Nathan Hirsch on Facebook or LinkedIn, the real Nate Hirsch on Instagram or Twitter. Um, if you want an awesome tool that we built that we give away for free called the VA calculator, outsourceschool.com slash VA calculator. And it'll actually, you'll be able to put in the numbers of your business. You'll be able to put in how aggressive or how conservative you want to be. And it'll tell you how many VAs you can afford right now, which is a great first step, good information to know. And you can get that right on the outsource school website. Sweet. Cool. I'll put all those links down there for people as well. Awesome. All right, man. Well, let's, let's some quick fire questions and then we'll, we'll round it up and, and, uh, and sign off. So first question for you, Nathan is what is your favorite word? <laughs> hustle. I actually, usually on podcasts, I wear a shirt that says hustle right there. <laughs> nice. Where is it today, man? Come on. I know. I, I think I wore it the past two days, so I, I didn't wear it today. Uh, don't be don't be that quarantine guy who wears the same shit for a week. <laughs> I, I'm like a very frugal guy, so I wear the same clothes all the time. I clean my clothes, but I don't, I'm not. I'm I've probably been wearing the same clothes for the past five years. It just means you're more focused on other stuff that matters, right? Like why? Right. <laughs> uh, what's your What's your least favorite word? Oh man. Um, probably something along the lines of like, no, or, or can't do it. Like uh, I, I, this happens all the time in business where there's a problem and you're like, we can't solve it. And I just don't accept that in any way. There's always a way, right? Even if you maybe aren't able to figure it out, you can find solutions with other people and, and resources. The internet can solve most problems anyway. Right. Exactly. What, uh, what turns you on in an intellectual or creative kind of capacity? I like people that have made it from, from like nothing. I think it's easy. Like when you're a celebrity or you have a lot of money, it's easy to start a business with a lot of money. Not that there aren't failures too, but to me, I really respect people who just went out there and grinded and built it from nothing from an idea. People who maybe got laughed at or rejected and all of that. Cause I can relate. People thought I was crazy when I was selling baby products on Amazon. So stories like that to, to learn from <clears throat> right now, I'm reading the, the book on Elon Musk and he 
not, got into PayPal and, and sold a little bit there, but he put it all on the line and he built it. He, he really took a lot of risks and everyone thought he was stupid. People bet against his stocks and, and obviously he's on the top now. So those are the kinds of things that, that I like to learn from. That's interesting, right? I was going to talk to you about that where you said there are people uh, judged you at the beginning and laughed at you for selling baby products when you were in college or fresh out of college. How, how did you deal with that? Because that must have been tough in some ways, but you clearly just persevered. What was the mindset sort of around that at that time? Yeah, and I haven't talked about this too much on podcasts. Uh, There's probably like a point where I just like flipped a switch and I was just like, from this point forward, I just don't care what people think. And you kind of have to do that. It, the alter, I don't know what the alternative is, but you have to just become none to all of that. And I mean, they didn't know how much money I was making. They didn't know what the business was. They thought I was running a Ponzi scheme. And at the end of the day, you can't please everyone. And if someone wants to learn, if someone has questions, like you'd be open, you'd be honest, you do your best to make people happy. If you make a mistake, you own up to it, you fix it. And if, if after all of that, people don't like you, if people don't respect you, if people um, make fun of you, whatever it is, there's just not that much you can do. You have to tone those people out and move on. Sure. And with your parents being teachers and you spoke about that academic route and like the job for life. And I can relate, like my dad was a super academic. It was always like, you got to go to college, get a degree, work a good job, go up the ladder. And then not doing that had some tense moments. Um, like eventually he got around to coming on board and seeing, you know, the value in, in the journey of not doing that. How was that? Like, did you have that kind of clash or were your folks actually super supportive of it all? Yeah. I'm fortunate. My parents were really supportive. They've always been supportive. Their mentality is as soon as we graduate college, we, me and my sister had to be out of the house. Like that was the, we couldn't go back, live back home. And as long as we didn't show up homeless, like they were going to support us. If I wanted to go try to be on Broadway, if I wanted to start a business, if I want to get a job. Now, when it became time to decide on, do I take a job or work on the Amazon business when it was time to graduate, they were definitely leaning more towards the health insurance and the stability and all the stuff that came along with that. But it was always my decision. They were going to be supportive either way. They always tried to get me to weigh the pros and cons. And they obviously felt like the cons were, or the pros were more towards the stability side. But I think now they, they obviously know that I made the right decision and all of that. That's awesome. You should do that Broadway thing, man. I can see it. Like v, VA, the Broadway musical. Maybe like <laughs> it, in 10 years, you should develop it's, that. It's so funny because you were like, oh, we're going to do something that we normally do, or you don't do see on other podcasts. I was on this podcast once where they made me sing at the end of it. And that was like the weirdest thing that I've ever been a part of. And I was like, please don't tell me I have to sing again. I'm not going to make <laughs> you do that because then I'd have to sing and then I just lose like every viewer I've ever built. So I forgot that. <laughs> um, okay, back to the question. So let's ramp through these. What, what turns you off in the same capacity around, you know, intellectual and spiritual stuff? What turns you off? <sighs> Good question. What turns me off? I don't know. Any type of like cockiness or people that feel like they, they, they accomplish it without other people. Like no one gets to the top by themselves. You have so much, there's a certain element of luck. There just is not that you're all lucky, but there's an element of luck. There's an element of other people helping you. There's an element of your childhood and your support system around you. So anyone that, that feels like they got to the top by themselves, like to me, that, that turns me off. Yeah, it's bullshit. It's a balance though, right? Like what's that quote? Faster, uh, faster alone, further together. It's like you right. kind of have to pick one at the right time, but ultimately collaboration is going to take you so much, so much further. Uh, right. what, what's your favorite swear word, dude? Swear word? <laughs> I'm not going to say a swear word. I've actually never sworn on a podcast. Wow. That's just not in All my right. brand. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, that's a fair shout. Um, yeah. That that's the first time I probably had that answer. I like that. Yeah. And uh, not that I don't swear in life, it happens. I'm not perfect and I'm not one of those like no swear persons, but I don't know. Just to me, it, to me, it's a part of the, the reputation that, that I built that, that I'd like to keep in place. No, but I like that acute awareness of like the brand and who you are and how you're perceived. And that's a totally cool answer as well. Um, what's your favorite sound or noise? <laughs> So there's this running joke in my friends that I, so I get amped up for everything. As you can tell, I'm pretty like high energy. Like if I'm playing sports, if I'm at the gym, like I'm crushing, I'm going all out, I'm burning a thousand calories an hour. So it, for me, it's here we go. And I have all, I, we have like group chats where people will be like, get excited about something. Someone gets a promotion and someone will just give me like a, here we go. And I don't know how I originated doing that, but that's just been something that stuck around for years. That's your catchphrase. You need like a t-shirt yeah. with that on there or something, right? <laughs> exactly. what's, what's your least favorite sound or noise 
<laughs> so my gym does this stupid thing where they bring out these sleds and they put them on the, the concrete outside and you have to push them. And it's the only activity that I refuse to do. I don't know how people do it. It, it hurts my ears to like a crazy level. So I'd rather do like two minutes of burpees than, than go out and push that sled. And that is by far my, my least favorite noise in, in, day-to-day, in day-to-day life. Yeah, fair enough. It was like some scratching, screeching on concrete. Yeah, kind it's of. like worse than a chalkboard. I don't know. I really, I, I tell them all the time, like, I don't know how you people do this. Mm. Uh, what profession other than your own or the ones you've done already would you most like to attempt? <laughs> I'd love to be a professional baseball player. That'd be great. Oh. I mean, that was my passion growing up. Played a lot of baseball. Big baseball fan. I think opening day was yesterday and that's not happening. So yeah. pretty sad about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, if I could pick anything and not be an entrepreneur, that'd probably be it. Sweet. And uh, what profession would you definitely never want to do under any circumstance? So my dad's a physics teacher, so he's all about science. And growing up, I hated science. It was my least favorite subject. I don't know. I, I definitely like yeah. missed the genes there 100%. So okay. anything via science, I'm staying away from. Okay. I'm sure your dad will be happy to hear that. <laughs> Uh, finally, dude, let's, let's wrap it up when it's all said and done and you know, the smoke's cleared. What would you like the story of your life to be? I I just want to be known for treating people. Well, that's what I've always tried to do, whether it's a client, whether it's a freelancer, whether it's a virtual assistant. I mean, my, my mentality is I want people to be better off after meeting me, after working with me and hopefully that that's happened. And I think I still have a lot of work to do as well. Awesome. Love it. Well, listen, man, you've already given us a shout as to where people can find you, which I'll link again at the end for people. Uh, Floors over to you here for the last few seconds. Anything you want to plug or shout about or any kind of final comments, the floor is yours, Nathan. Yeah. uh, During these times, I mean, focus on what you can control. Focus on on smart business decisions. Focus on communication. We're all going to get through this together one way or another. None of us know how it's going to end, but there's going to be businesses that took this time when we're locked at home to to build and to grow and to learn things and to focus on what we can control. And there's going to be lots of other people that spend the time watching Netflix and doing other things. And once all of this kind of passes, we're going to see what happened there. And I kind of relate it to around year two of free up. I had shoulder surgery and knee surgery in the same month. And I was locked on an air mattress downstairs and eat my, both my showers were upstairs. So my, my fiance had to like hose me down outside. Like it was a rough few months, but during that time, I literally had nothing to do but work on free up. It was like work on free up, play video games, read books. Like there wasn't too much to do from that air mattress. And we're kind of in the same boat. I'm, I'm locked inside. I can take my dogs out. I can work out an hour a day, but I'm not doing too much. So take this time to, to focus and work on your business. And that's what I'm doing with Outsource School. Love that. That's an awesome message. Awesome. Well, listen, man, thank you so much for coming on. I think there's a load of really interesting stuff in here that people can leverage and learn from. And hopefully they'll connect with you on all those different platforms. And yeah, we'll maybe come back uh, down the line and we can talk about how Outsource School has grown and and see what you're up to in in a year or two. That'd be great. Awesome, man. Appreciate your time. No, likewise. All right. Take care, buddy.